All right, this is the video assignment for week seven, our final week of video assignments. So we're going to be looking, I just realized I had a typo there. That's supposed to be seven on that. Um, but we're gonna be looking at a lot of information on the day one and not so much on the day two. The day two um, is gonna be a pretty quick one, but day one, we need to set some ground uh, work for some of the stuff we're gonna do in class. So. We talked about last time in 6B4, the contingency tables. So we're gonna be looking at 7A1 contingency tables again, but using those to interpret false positives or false negatives in a kind of a, an application to the real world. So this is just a kind of a generic table filled out here, but this is the table below is a specific type of contingency table used to determine the effectiveness of a test. Suppose a person has a disease the doctor then will test for that disease and the test will either give a positive result, which is not good when you're talking about Medicaid or medical world. That means you actually show that you have the disease or a negative result on the test, which means you do not have the disease. We can summarize the four possible situations a patient could be in using the table below. So if you actually have the disease or do not have the disease, even if you have it or you don't have it, there's a possibility your test could come out uh, positive or negative. So there's the columns that say either I tested positive or I tested negative. And notice our totals. This is the total number of positive tests that that test has gotten. This is the total number of negative tests that the test has gotten. This uh, row would be the total number of people who actually have disease, no matter which way they tested. Um, and then the total people who do not have the disease that they're testing for. So within this, we know that no test is perfect. So if you have the disease and the test identifies it, that's a true positive. That means the test did its job. If you have the disease and the test comes back negative, it means it missed something in the blood work. It, this is actually a very dangerous one for a patient um, because you would have something that's still staying undiagnosed. So false negative means you actually do have that disease they're trying to test for, but the test did not show it. Um, if you don't have a disease, now this is more common. This type of false is more common. Um, it would say, oh, we saw something in your blood work that makes us think you have the disease, but after like following up and doing more testing, they sometimes find out, no, you don't. So that's a false positive. We think you have the disease, but after investigating later, you don't. But the test did trigger a positive result. Um, and then the false negative, uh, or excuse me, true negative. So you don't have the disease and the test says you don't. So that is also a, the test did what it was supposed to. So a patient that tests positive, despite ha not having the disease, is considered the false positive. A patient that tests negative, despite having the disease, is considered a false negative, okay? So we just wanna make sure we understand those two because we're gonna be asked to do those two prob probabilities a couple times. So this is the formulas for both. To find the probability of a false positive, you do the following fraction. You look at all positive results, and then we look at how many of those came out false. So they came out incorrectly marking people as positive. To find the probability of getting a false negative on a test, you take all the negative test results. So this is conditional. And then you look at just how many of those were false negatives, okay? So they incorrectly said you did not have the disease. All right, sometimes the table will be completed for you and sometimes we will need to fill it in ourselves. So here's one where we need to fill it in. So it says a corporation requires employees to take an annual drug test. The test has a 98% accuracy rating. What that means is 98% of the time, it will correctly um, tell, tell me that people who use drugs will test positive, okay? Um, and it also will be 98% of the time, people who don't use drugs, it'll tell us they don't use drugs. It'll actually say true negative, okay? It is known that 5% of the employees that are at this company use drugs. Now, usually you wouldn't know that information, but that's that's what we know. So we know the number of drug users will be able to figure that total out. The test was given to all 1,000 employees. So the first thing we need to do is find that total number of people who we know somehow, magically, that they use drugs. Um, if you knew that, I don't know why you'd be testing them. So 0 0.05 times 1,000, that means 50 people who work here are supposed to be drug users. Um, then that means our total of all the people surveyed was 1,000. And then notice we can find this one by doing 1,000 minus the 50. So that'd be 950. So we've got our totals of 
because of this, we knew how many people use drugs in the company and we knew how many people we had. We were able to find the total of the drug users, the non-drug users, and the total people, okay? So let's talk about how we fill in the middle. Well, you start with the, you wanna start with the ones where the tests performed correctly. We know that accuracy rating. So right here, this part right here, this is use drugs and the test said, yep, you use drugs. The test was accurate. If we wanna find that, we know that 98% of the people who use drugs, so that's that 50 people, they should be correctly identified as using drugs. Okay, so 0.98 times 50. That means it's gonna get 49 of those 50 people. They're gonna get caught. It's gonna say, yep, you're one of the ones who use the drugs. That means one person is going to skirt by. They're gonna show that they did not have drugs in their system on the blood work or pee test or whatever they're doing. Um, they're gonna say, nope, you don't use drugs, but they actually did, okay? The other place where we would have accuracy being correct is if they do not use drugs, the test is gonna say negative. Because remember, negative means you don't actually have that in your system. It's saying, nope, you don't have it. So we also have that 98% accuracy on that group, but this time it's out of a total of 950 non-drug users, okay? So 0.98 times the 950 is 931. Okay, and so we can take 950 minus those 931 people and we can figure out how many people got incorrectly flagged for drug use even though they don't actually use drugs. This one's the scarier one for me in this scenario. When we were doing the medicine um, ones from 6B4, it's, to me it's scarier that you have a disease and it misses that on the test. But like if you're doing a drug test, it's very scary to have them possibly fire you because it said you use drugs, but you didn't actually use drugs. That one would be more terrifying in that regard. Um, so we can add these to get our totals of how many positive test results did they get and how many negatives. So 19 plus 49 is 68 people were identified with a positive test. And nine, that's just adding 931 and one. So that's going to be 932. And notice that should also add to our thousand people. So um, that would be how we would fill out that table. Um, so this is just showing you that you might have to fill out the table um, specifically yourself if they give you enough information. So that's how you would do this one. Okay. Didn't ask for any follow-up situations. I could figure out the probability of a false positive and a probability of a false negative. Um, we have those formulas up above, but we're going to be doing that in some of the other tables. Okay. So let's look at this one. It says an endocrinologist wants to determine if a new brand of test is effective in detecting whether or not a patient has diabetes. Complete the contingency table below. Okay. So we have a few things we know. We can find the total of people. Now this time they did switch. You just be aware that they can do either direction on um, Newton. Sometimes it'll be disease and no disease here, and then positive test and negative test here. This time they did positive test in a row, negative test in a row, and then disease and no disease in the columns. They're both valid ways of setting up the table. Um, so I can get that total of positive tests by doing 675 minus the 236. That would be 439. I can find the number of people who have no disease and negative tests by doing 225 minus the 21, I should be able to do that in my head. That's 204. And then I don't have anything I can subtract here, but I have enough now in the rows that I should be able to figure it out. So I can do 675 minus the 225 to get the number of people in the disease total, which would be 450. And then minus the 32 above that will tell me how many people had a positive test, which was 418. Okay, so this is all filled in now. Uh, it says use the table above to determine the probability that a positive result of a test is a false positive. So remember, a probability of a false positive is the number of positive tests total. And then how many of those were false positives? Okay, so they were te positive tests and they incorrectly said um, that you had disease when you didn't. Okay, so remember, Total number of positive tests, oh, sorry, this happened the wrong, wrong setup. Positive test was 439, okay? So that's that part. And then the number of people who were falsely identified. 
So remember, a positive test means you have the disease. So if it's falsely identifying you, these people right here were the false um, positive indicators, okay? They were the ones who, they don't actually have diabetes, but the test said they do. So that's the 21. Um, and then we need to check to see if this reduces so factors that go into 21 are three and seven. So if we see in 21, so we can check 439 divided by three, doesn't go. 439 divided by seven, doesn't go. And 439 just divided by 21. I'm just trying all my factors of 21, it doesn't go. So that's actually already reduced. So 21 over 439, okay. All right, so that moves us into 7A2, data distribution, symmetric versus skewed. So types of data distributions in this section, we're gonna look at these three pictures. There is the symmetric data distribution. It looks like it's evenly spaced around its highest peak or center. That's usually how ours are going to look. It says it's a balanced distribution of both the left and right tails where its mean is approximately equal to the median. So the middle of the data and the mean or average are pretty much right there almost in the center together. Skewed right is an uneven frequency distribution where the mean value is larger than the median. So the median is going to be somewhere towards the, the middle, actually, still. And I'm just guesstimating where that might be. Medium of all the data. And then the mean is getting pulled higher by some outliers, is what we call them. So when you think about this, this is like if you had, I always use school as an example. Let's say we gave a test. And most of the class scored in the 60% range. But then you had a couple Bs and As that bring the average up. So even though most people uh, scored in the 60s, having like a couple hundred percents or 90%, those are going to bring the overall average up out of the middle. Okay. And notice, I always, uh, this is kind of my generic little thing. It's the whale of the tail. That's which direction you're skewed. So if you imagine a whale, woo, yay. <laughs> so there's my whale there's his tail, okay? So his tail is to the right. So the whale of the tail is the way you're skewed. Um, so skewed left is the opposite of skewed right. So this time the median is actually higher and then the mean is getting pulled down by some lower outliers, some real low scores. So again, using test, let's say most people on the test made an 80%. So the middle of our data might be in the 80s. But let's say a couple people didn't show up and maybe somebody really bombed it and made it like a 10% or something. Those really low scores are going to pull the average, which is where you add all of your data up and divide by how many you have. It's going to pull that down. Okay. And again, the whale of the tail this time, you imagine drawing him, there's his bullet hole at the top. He's to the left. So he's skewed left. That's a silly saying, but it always helped me. Um, so this is just a picture and it's really pixelated. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it has kind of what's the difference. So symmetric, the mean, median, and mode are all kind of there at the same spot. Right skewed, the mode is the highest peak. The median is going to kind of be towards the middle of all the, if you imagine shading the areas and finding the areas of all these rectangles, it's going to be the middle between splitting those areas in half. And then the mean is going to be pulling up by those data points that are really high. Opposite for the left skewed, um, you have the mode is still the highest peak there. The median is going to be a little smaller than that, and the mean is definitely getting pulled down from the low data values, okay? So how do you tell if you don't have a picture? Well, if you do at least have the mean and the median, like if those numbers are given to you, you can tell if you're skewed left, symmetric, or skewed right. So if your mean is significantly, by significantly, I mean more than a point or two away. So like if they tell me my mean is 68 and my median is 69, 68 is not significantly smaller than 69. But if they tell me my mean is 52 and my median is 68, I mean, that's exaggerating kind of, but that's very significantly smaller, okay? So if the mean, which is your average, is smaller significantly than your median, which is your middle of your data, then you're skewed left. If your mean and median are approximately the same, notice they didn't say exactly, but are pretty close to the same, then we have a balanced tail or symmetric data. If the mean is significantly greater than the middle or median, then we have a skewed right situation. So looking at these pictures below, so it says identify the histogram as symmetric, skewed left or skewed right, then look at where we think the mean and median and what it would be, and is the mean greater, equal, or less than the median, okay? So we're just trying to just, just see if that uh, we can write that statement. 
So notice the whale of my tail is to the right on this one. So this is skewed right. And that reason for the mean or median being smaller here, the mean is going to be directly related by these very high um, A's and B's that are not what are typical for the rest of the class's scores. So we would say that the mean is greater than the median in this scenario, okay? This one is skewed to the left because the whale of the tail is to the left. And that means my average is getting pulled down. So my mean is less than my median. This one's pretty symmetric. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it's pretty symmetric. So this would be symmetric. And that means that my mean is approximately equal to my median. May not be exact, but they're pretty close. Okay, let's look at these, just giving us numbers. You're told that a data set has a median of 13 and a mean of 23. We always wanna say the mean is blank to the median. So the mean here is greater than the median, which means if you look up here, that means I'm getting an average that's being pulled high. So it's gonna have a tail to the right. So this is the data is skewed to the right. Um, this one has a 15 states were surveyed and we had a mean of 54 and a median of 57. So this time the mean is less than the median. So this one would be um, skewed to the left because your mean's getting pulled down. Now, you might want to argue on how what is significantly different. Um, I would say if we were at 55, 53, we would probably go for symmetrical. Um, anytime I have a gap of more than three points or three or more, I would be more likely to say we are slightly skewed. They don't really use that word, but we are slightly skewed to the left or right. And then the more you move out that gap, the more skewed it is, significantly skewed versus slightly skewed. All right, let's look at 7A3. So this says create and interpret histograms, frequency tables, and relative frequencies. So a histogram in simple terms is a bar graph with continuous numerical data. So that means there's no gaps between the bars. So look at this. Even though that looks like there's a gap there, that's just zero outcomes. So it's a green a uh, line showing that right at the zero that there's none of those in that group. So you can see that right there. Um, the height of each bar of a histogram will correspond to how many times that item scored in our data set, okay? Um, it could also be changed to the relative frequency, which is the decimal version or getting towards like what percent was it, okay? So if you notice this, this is a set of scores that were given, um, test scores. Someone made a frequency table or tally chart. You've probably made those before in your life um, where they said fifth scores from 50 to 58. Oh, we got one of those. Okay. No scores from 59 to 67. You can triple check that. They had three scores from 68 to 76. So that's 69, that's 75, and that's 73. Those were those three scores. 77 to 85, so that would be the 78, the 80, the 78, the 85, and the 83. So that was one, two, three, four, five. And then 86 to 94, that was the 92, the 94, the 94, and the 88. So that's where they got this four, okay? Now the histogram, notice we have these were, they just scored the grades based on, maybe they're doing like a plus minus system of some kind, but this is kind of how Miss Nerd grouped her groups together. There's a whole bit on that in statistics where we actually teach you how to come up with those intervals. We're not gonna be messing with that. We're just gonna show you how to make the tables and make the, um, the graph from that, the histogram. But, you know, we've got these intervals of scores and then we graph the frequency is how many did we have in each interval? So we had one, so notice a height of one. We had zero in the next group, so notice a height of zero. We had three, so a height of three for the frequency, height of five, five test scores in that group and four test scores in this group. So that's how they come up with that histogram, okay? Now, in your Newton homework, you will drag each bar to the correct spot. This is gonna be how kind of it looks. I've created a demo of this in the next little part we're gonna look at. Um, but you know, you're know you gonna be grabbing a point and dragging it up or down to the correct height. So that's how they're gonna have you graph them. So um, this is one I wanna do and I'm gonna use my little demo graph. Yours will be built into your homework so you don't have to worry about that. 
Um, but given the following frequency distribution table for a set of data about the time spent studying for final exam and hours for all math students taking a statistics class, we want to construct a histogram that accurately summarizes the data. So they've already come up with the frequencies for us. Um, I want to make sure I can open that. Let me see if I can get off of that and open this link. So we're going to try to do a split screen. So let me pause real quick and get that set up. Okay, so I pulled up mine. You don't need to worry about all my behind the scenes stuff, but I wanted to kind of show you, you know, yours might be all flat. They may have your bars at different heights. When you go into your homework, who knows how it'll look, okay? So it might be crazy all over the place. Um, and I believe theirs will also actually read the height, the digit for you. So notice I've set up my intervals at the bottom, 0 0.5 to 1.5, 1.5 to 2.5, 2.5 to 3.5, and so on, okay? So we would drag these points to their correct height. So there's one item in that first group, three items in the second group, four items in the third group, five items in the fourth group, seven in the fifth group, and two in the last group. So that would be my completed histogram for that. Okay, so I just wanted to show you um, how it's going to kind of look and function in your homework. So let's go back to just our full notes. Make sure it's on full share. Um, so according to that histogram, how many math students took greater than 2.5, but less than 3.5? So you could do that from the histogram, but you can also read it off the frequency table. So greater than 2.5, but less than 3.5. So this little range right here goes from 2.5 to 3.5. So it's going to be four students that did that. Okay, according to the histogram or the chart up here, how many students study 4.5 hours or more? Okay, so that's 4.5, which starts here, or actually, no, sorry, a little bit further down. That's 3.5. 4.5 actually starts in between these two groups, and they said or more, so that goes all the way to the end. So that would be 7 plus 2, which is 9. And we could, again, read that off of the histogram as well by just adding those two bars together. All right, so that's the end of our day one video. It's the longer one of the two. I'll be back soon with day two.